Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And here comes our star-studded show train. Tonight, the Association of American Railroads presents Victor Herbert's charming operetta, Orange Blossoms, starring Gordon McRae and his charming guest, Evelyn Case. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and the music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Yes, tonight, another great musical success is brought to you by the American Railroads, the same railroads that bring you most of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and all the other things you use in your daily life. And now, here is our star, Gordon McRae. Thank you, Marvin Miller, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In Victor Herbert's charming operetta, Orange Blossoms, I play Roger Belmont. And lovely Evelyn Case is Kitty, the girl who gets kissed in the dark. Oh, that kiss in the dark Was to him just a lark But to her it was a thrill supreme You're my lawyer, Brasick. Do something. Well, Roger... What do you want me to do? Well, it's spring, and I'm in love. I want you to help me. Well, they didn't teach us about these things in law school. Brasick, there's only one woman alive in the whole world, as far as I'm concerned. Well, who is it this time? Ruth? No. Mary? No. Sheila? Absolutely not. Helen. Oh, I, I thought I'd been in love before, Brasick, but Helen tops them all. It's true that I'm susceptible to ladies. It's true that I'm a weakness for their charms. I have always found it simple to succumb to just a dimple or an ankle or a lovely pair of arms. But now my mad philandering is over. Those maids of just one charm have left my mind. For my new love's a complete thing. I have found the only sweet thing. Who has all the other charmers' charms combined? Though I've always played about, I can say without a doubt, this time it's love. For the thumping of my heart seems to whisper from the start. This Time it's love. She has made this weary world a fairyland, and the skies are blue above. I have felt this way before in my small affairs of yore, but this time it's love. Though he's always played about, he can say without a doubt. This time it's love Cause the thumping of his heart Seemed to whisper from the start This time it's love She has made this weary world A fairyland And the skies are blue above I have felt this way before In my small affairs of yore but this time it's love. Brassic, I want to marry Helen, but, well, there's a problem. Maybe we can solve it legally. Well, let's get all this down on paper. Uh, what's her full name? Helen de Vaque. Oh, a divorcee, isn't she? Yes. Aunt Mary and I both met Helen on the Riviera. I loved her immediately. And Aunt Mary loathed her. So she said, if ever... I saw Helen again. She disinherited me. <laughs> but you saw her anyhow? No. No, Helen left the Riviera a few days later. I would have followed her, but Aunt Mary became ill. And naturally, as her prospective heir, my place was by her side. Naturally. 
By the time Aunt Mary died, I I had forgotten. You had forgotten Madame de Vasquez? Oh, no, no, no. I'd forgotten her address. Anyhow, I saw her again, never saw her again, until I met her by chance last week. Now we're engaged to be married. I see. Brasek, my aunt left me $17 million. A sum I have the greatest respect for. <laughs> well, almost as respectable as uh, $18 million. Ah, but in her will, she says that I can only inherit that money if I marry within the year. And if I do not marry any woman who is the divorced wife of a Brazilian subject. Helen's former husband was a Brazilian? Yes. What can I do, Brasek? I don't want to lose Helen. And I don't want to lose the money. Well, why not marry someone else? Uh, just temporarily, a marriage of convenience. At the end of a year, you can get a divorce and, and marry Helen. Where can I find a woman who'd do that? I know just the lady. All right. I'm in your hands. I can't say that I care very much for the idea. Well, Kitty, I have to have someone I can trust, and after all, you are my godchild. That isn't necessarily a guarantee that you can trust me. Well, you you can use the money. Yes. Well, then what's the matter? Oh, nothing really. It's just that, like every other girl in the world, I've had my own dreams of spring and love and orange blossoms. In every girl's heart, there is a dream, a golden dream of orange blossoms. She always longs to start upon with that bouquet of orange blossoms So until her pretty red Romeo Falls a victim to her room There'll always be a dream Of orange blossoms We are all in love with you. You had better run along and play. You are sweet as morning dew. I won't listen to a word you say. Kitty, darling, please be fair with us. You are just a pack of flirts. We are after you, you dear. You are after anything in don't you like the way we play? I think you all should marry. That's a blow, you know. But this is so. If you'd like to look them over, Kitty. If you say they're all right, I'll sign them. Well, there's a clause stating that if anything develops of a personal nature between you and the gentleman, you forfeit the settlement. His fiancée insisted on that. And she's quite a jealous woman. She doesn't have to worry about anything of a personal nature developing under circumstances like these. There, that sign. Oh, uh, come in. I'm sorry I'm late. My car stalled in traffic. Roger. What? You've met. Why, I, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. 
I'm sorry. For a moment, I thought we had. Well, this is the young lady. Kissy, may I present Roger Belmont. And Roger, this is my godchild, Miss Winthrop. If you wouldn't mind waiting in the next room, Roger, we're just completing the arrangement. Why, of course. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Winthrop. So that's the man. Well, what's the matter, Kitty? Of course he wouldn't remember. Why should he? I was just a schoolgirl. I recall the mad delight of a lovely dark and a stroll into a night trembling with romance. Dear, he told me of my love. How could I resist? Suddenly within his arms, I was held and kissed. Oh, the kiss in the dark was to him just a lark, but to me it was a thrill. I remember now. We were both such children that I had almost forgotten. Well, that's all right, Roger. Oh, that was love in all its power. Yet today it seems like a sweet but fleeting eye. for the second act of Orange Blossoms in just a moment. <laughs> Hear them? The whistles of the freight trains? Well, maybe I'm just imagining it, but it does seem to me that in that familiar sound there is an added note of pride. Anyhow, today's freight trains have good reason to be proud. For in 1951, the average freight train set a new record in serving you by hauling more tons of freight 
and hauling them faster than ever before. The railroad set that new efficiency record while doing the second largest job of hauling they have ever done in peacetime. And the important point is, you could not have lived as well as you did. The nation could not have had the goods and materials needed for commerce and defense without the kind and quantity of railroad service performed in 1951. Now, the reason the railroads have been able to do these bigger jobs and do them better stems largely from the fact that since the end of World War II, they have spent over $6 billion on improvements. That money, an average of over $1 billion a year, has bought the new and better equipment and facilities that have given the nation continually better railroad service. However, while the railroads hauled a near-record volume of traffic with record-breaking efficiency in 1951, their net earnings were way down. And the reason is that the wages, prices, and taxes they must pay have gone up so much more than the rates they can charge. That's why, as the railroads carry on with their essential improvement program, it is so important to all of us that they be allowed adequate freight rates. Only then will they be able to keep on raising the money needed for the continued improvement that can alone give America the transportation it needs for commerce and defense. Now for the second act of Orange Blossom, starring Gordon McRae and his guest, Evelyn Case. Oh, that kid. To him just a lark, but to her it was a thrill so thrill. So Kitty and I were married. I rented a house for her and she lived there alone. I hardly ever saw her. Since Helen was my fiance, she naturally resented any display of affection on my part towards my wife. However, I did go out to see Kitty with my attorney on the day before she was to file for divorce. I wasn't nearly as happy about the whole thing as I thought I would be. But I left the room so Kitty could talk to the lawyer alone. Out on the veranda, I didn't mean to eavesdrop. Yet, well, you know how it is when they're talking about you. Well, Kitty, are you happy? Why should I be happy? The year is up. Now you can get your divorce, collect your settlement, and live the way you want to live. The way I want to live? If I could live the way I really want to live, I'd live here with Roger. It's only a lonely nest. I'm lonely and uncaressed. There's no... that way. I had no idea. I'm no good for you. I'm a philanderer, a heel. I'm a bum. I I know it. You're no good at all. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I don't like you at all. I just want to stay married to you. Kitty, you'll be a free woman tomorrow. You'll meet lots of attractive men. But how could anyone be as attractive as you are? You're right about that. (laughs) It doesn't matter to you how I feel, does it? All that matters is how Helen feels. No, that isn't all that matters. Kitty, you, you've got to find a man and be happy, too. Why any man would fall for you. Tell them all to run along and play. You are sweet as morning dew. I won't listen to a word you say. Kitty, darling, do yourself be fair. Men are all You'll find one for whom you care Men are after anything in sky Don't you like
like the way men play. I ask them not to tarry. Then they'll go, you know. I wish it so. yourself today. Now, Kitty, everything's going to be all right for you. I'm sure of it. Well, living here alone has probably made you over-sentimental. I'm sure tomorrow you'll feel a great deal differently. Are you? I'm positive. You tell her that, Roger. You can make her understand. Kitty, these days are trying, but they can never last. Worry will soon be buried in so though we know it is hard for us to bear, bravely we'll face this night time of despair. Then comes the dawning of morning so splendid that fair tomorrow when sorrow Storm must come and go before the dawn begins to glow. And so, although our troubles seem double in gray light, they disappear in the clear sunny daylight. The Must pass along. Then comes the dawning, and life is like a song. Then comes the dawning of morning, so splendid that fair tomorrow when sun. This is my wife. Uh, Kitty, this is my fiance. How do you How do? You do? <laughs> You've broken the terms of your agreement, you know, Roger. It is stated in the contract most clearly nothing of a personal nature is to develop between you two. All right. I forfeited the settlement. You can keep your money. I wouldn't touch it anyway. Kitty. Don't worry. I won't spoil your little romance. I never want to see you again. Is that clear, Roger? I hope you're both very happy. Kitty! Oh, let her go, my dear. You know you hate women who make scenes. Thank 
goodness she'll be out of your life for good tomorrow. Ellen. Yes, darling. Goodbye. What did you say? I said goodbye. <laughs> Modern marriage, a, a marriage of convenience. You know as well as I do, a fellow can't get along without modern conveniences. Case will be back in just a moment. Now, thanks to Isabel Jewell, Howard McNair, and to our entire company. Orange Blossoms, with music by Victor Herbert and book and lyrics by Fred de Graysock and B.G. De Silva, was dramatized for the Railroad Hour by Gene Holloway. The Railroad Hour is brought to you each week at this time by the American Railroads. Last year, Americans lived better and America grew stronger as the nation's productive might swelled. And your railroad an essential part of all production, whether for commerce or defense, did their part, setting a new record for efficiency and hauling a near-record peacetime volume of freight. Despite that fact, railroad earnings continued to fall as expenses went up faster and farther than railroad rates and revenues. Today, as the railroads carry on with their billion-dollar-a-year program of investment in better facilities for better service, it's important to all of us they be allowed to earn the money they need for that program. Now, here again is charming Evelyn Case. Thank you, Gordon. Tell me, do you have this trouble every week on the railroad hour, trying to decide which girl to marry? Well, Evelyn, it seems as if every story in the musical theater was written to be played on just one instrument, the triangle. No, no, Carmen, not the musical triangle, the eternal triangle. <laughs> Who are the corners of your triangle next week, Gordon? Well, one corner is the devil. Mephistopheles himself. For I'm going to play the author of Faust, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And the prettier corner of the triangle will be the gracious star of pictures and Broadway, lovely Patricia Morris. It must be Franz Lehar's delightful Frederica. Well, that's right, Evelyn. Will you listen to see if I get the girl? No, oh, I already know. But I'll listen anyway. Good night, Gordon. Good night, Evelyn. All aboard. Well, friends, it looks as though we're ready to pull out. And so until next Monday night and Frederica, this is Gordon McRae saying good night. <laughs> Orange Blossoms was presented by special arrangement with the Tams Whitmark Music Library. Gordon McRae can be seen starring in Warner Brothers Starlit. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. This is Marvin Miller saying goodbye until next week for the American Railroads. Now keep tuned for your Monday night of music on NBC. <laughs> The preceding was transcribed. Hear Barbara Gibson on the telephone hour next on NBC.